Right, boys and girls, a very special guest in the flesh, in person, all the way from the UK. It's Dr. Sarah Pugh. Welcome to our house. We're just introducing Sarah to the natives. The goats. But the don't goats. worry, we're not going to eat the goats. No, well, not today, anyway. Yes. Yes, you're quite safe today, Mr. Goat. Yes. Yes, or Miss Goat, whichever it is. I don't know, I haven't been looking. Right, anyway, we're going to go on a guided tour, so thanks for joining us. Stick around, because... In the next day or so, we're going to do a video about something. Yes, look forward to it. Right, have we got all our ducks in a row? Hmm? Have we? Have we got everybody? Yes, there we are. Lovely. Off for a little ducky mission. And here we are. At the chicken farm. The chicken farm. Come and be sermoned to, or whatever the word is. Preaching. Yes, preached at, Sermon. that's the word. Sermoned at. I'm not a native English speaker, you know. Book, 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 book. These are very well read chickens. Book, 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 book. I'm here all week. All oh, right. Mm, good. Just like not funny. <laughs> are you here to help? <laughs> and here we have a couple of native examples of the mullion plant from which you can make a tea which is an expectorant and a mucolytic so you just take the plant and dry it and make a tea and that's what it does can we pick some yeah you can we've also got some at home already if you like Sarah we can just can uh, you eat it Thank you for joining us once again. Joining me today in the studio here is Field Marshal Dr. Sarah Pugh, all the way from the UK, in the flesh. Welcome. Thank you very much, Bart. Mm, it's an absolute pleasure to have a fellow Field Marshal and Senior Officer of the Meat Militia here with us today. Um, anyway, enough silliness. What are we going to talk about? I think we should talk about your 90-day carnivore challenge and maybe a bit about my strange carnivore experiences in Vietnam. Uh, mm -hmm. A bit about quantum biology for people who are struggling with a carnivore and want to look into something else that's not to do with food but still want to stay carnivore. Uh, what else do we talk about on our walk today? A bit of mitochondria, I think. Lovely. And I think the priming we were talking about with carnivore it was where we'll start because I think as a woman, some people are terrified of this idea of eating huge amounts of calories to um, improve your metabolism. So should we start there? Sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Very good. So priming, 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 priming. Um, well, let's start. You, you tell us your experience with priming because yours was different to mine. Yeah, because the thing is, my experience uh, was that when I was trying to do my priming, it wasn't my thyroid that was a problem. I had a bit of an issue with leptin resistance. And because leptin is a circadian hormone, um, as well as your viewers might know, if you eat too much fructose, you can mess up your leptin. If you eat too late at night, you can mess up your leptin because basically leptin's job is like an accountant. It tells your body how much body fat you've got to burn the next day. So if it's not working properly, your body doesn't know how much fat is on you. So you run into weight problems. Uh, but some people have trashed their leptin by too much crash dieting, too much fasting. And that's where um, and often they trash their thyroid as well. So that's where the priming can come in. Because basically it's about boosting your hormone levels so that when you come to it's healing as well. Mm. So I think um, some people coming to the carnivore diet are coming from, say, being plant based or from an eating disorder or from excessive fasting. So it would be we would I would look at it as a sort of healing uh, procedure to get into the carnivore diet. Um, when Bart did it the first time, you lost weight in the priming. So we, we might have to explain to people. No, what no, actually no, that's means. impossible. Calories in, calories out. Oh, yes. I'm lying. Yes. Yes. Because I think when, what it is, it's when Bart did it, he was eating something like 5,000 or 6,000 calories a day. But later we're going to talk about the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. And it's obviously not the calorie transport chain. And it's not 
the fat transport chain or the glucose transport chain. So I think for people who are thinking of doing some unusual, interesting way of eating for the new year, a lot of people, weight loss is a big concern, but also healing. So maybe mm -hmm. do you want to dive in and talk about what priming is so people can, because you, sure. you've done it. Yep. Okay, so priming is a usually two-week period, sometimes longer in the case-by-case -case basis for some people who mm. don't get the response that they, that they should get that tells us priming is done. Mm -hmm. uh, but normally for most people, two weeks, where what you do is it's 100% carnivore, it's all beef, preferably, and associated fat. And butter, if you like, salt, if you like, mm. water to drink, that's it. But what you do is you have three full meals a day plus snacks, such that the goal of priming is to fill yourself to rifting. You fill yourself to the gunnels, you eat until you cannot eat anymore. It is actually, you'd, you'd think, this is great, I can eat all I want, it's fantastic. It's not fantastic. It's horrific. It's it's hard. It's torturous. But also the interesting thing about it is really quickly, it's like with wild animals, they gorge on meat and stuff and they don't overeat. But when you um, basically gorge on carnivore food within about two weeks, you can't stand it. Whereas if you're eating pizzas and crisps and shit, basically, you can just carry on gorging mm. for the rest of your life. So it's for people who really... You know, people, the calories in versus calories out people or those who say it doesn't, you just eat whatever you like as long as you're in 2,000 calories or a calorie deficit. When you try and overeat on carnivore and do the priming, people who are a bit sort of wary about this, maybe overeaters are going to be quite shocked that food actually disgusts them and they don't mm -hmm. have to deprive themselves because we have our own inbuilt natural hormones. Leptin is important. There are others that basically say, right, you've had enough food now, stop eating. Yeah. Um, and obviously I mentioned leptin because there are some people who are leptin resistant and it's not because of bad diet. It's because of um, a circadian rhythm problem, as in body clocks, which can be too much blue light, not seeing the sunrise, stuff like that, which we'll come into later. Mm. But a lot of people um, find the priming actually quite a relief. Because um, I can't remember her. It's Bella, isn't it? The steak and butter girl. Yeah. She um, had really good results with it. Mm. And she was terrified because I think she came from a, is it a vegan background? And Originally, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So it, it, different things happen with different people. That some people, w when I first did it, I gained weight, but then I lost um, more than I gained. So I think I gained something like five or six pounds over it was three weeks and then it all just came off because you can't stand the idea of food also mm. anybody who finds fasting a problem you basically just fast all by yourself after the priming yeah and um yours was a different experience because you lost weight during your priming period yeah, that's right so my experience with that was and this is a thing I've been challenged by many, um, shall we say, intellectually challenged individuals mm. who support people like Greg Douchebag Doucette, mm. who are convinced absolutely that I must be lying when I say that I lost 15 pounds during that two weeks of priming. Oh, you must be lying, absolute lie, whatever else, whatever else. Or they say it must have been water weight. Mm. Well, it mostly was water weight. I never said it wasn't. Mm. Ever. I said I lost 15 pounds on the scale, and mm. that's what happened. As it turned out, if you believe the biometric impedance type scale situation, which is nee, whatever, fine. I've used the same scale all along, so it's at least consistent with itself. Mm. And it suggested to me that of those 15 pounds, 12 and a half of those were water, and about two and a half were fat. So, if you like, if you want to ignore the water weight, which is completely inappropriate because it's still weight, isn't it? It's still mass coming off your body. It's actually inflammation being flushed off the body. It's water being retained by the body that I don't need anymore. Mm -hmm. Anyway, forget that. Let's say I only lost two and a half pounds in two weeks of eating six to six and a half thousand calories every day. That still doesn't work, does it? Mm. I still must be lying because the calorie transport chain and the first law of thermodynamics, which is all about the conservation of mass, according to lame Norton, 
um, would say that that's impossible and it did not happen. Nonetheless, it did. Mm -hmm. mm, you didn't so much lose weight in your two weeks. No, mm. but then um, what suddenly happened was that by all by itself, my hormones corrected and suddenly I was eating the same and losing weight. Mm. So I was the same was going in, but more was coming off. So yeah. I think this can happen with some people when they go full carnivore, because I was ex I know some people don't exercise in the priming, but I was, and you can gain muscle mass, you can it can change blood volume. Yeah. It can there's multiple things which can cause extra weight on the body. Yeah. And sometimes it's just if you change your way of eating, your body gets a little bit stressed. I could have had estrogen changes and then all all of a sudden eating exactly the same um it started to come off and then by then i was back into the fasting i just didn't want to eat so it, it was disobeying this so-called law the other way and that's why i think people who just say oh you know just be in a calorie deficit or you know it's you're eating too much without looking at the biology and the hormones and the inflammation are mm. missing a trick yeah i think they're missing many tricks there's mm. there's the hormonal balance there's the inflammasome yes. there's uh, the mere fact of maybe being a female, that, yep. that seems to have a differential effect, although it's hard to pin it down and say men will lose weight on priming and women will gain it, because it's not true. No, it, I, there's a mix. No, I, there's lots of women that lose weight on priming, but I think my point was that a lot of men um, are not shy about gaining 10 pounds, because mm. what's the name of that guy really like, Stephen? Is what's the one in the UK? Because didn't he gain... Um, and then lost afterwards. That's right, yes. Um, Stephen Thomas, yes. Coach Steve. Yes. Um, he did, yes, he gained some weight. And um, then lost it and afterwards. And then lost it afterwards on, on the, the phase that comes after priming, which yeah. is where you start doing your rolling fasts and your OMAD and your two mads and all of those kind of things. And some um, women, I think it depends what you're coming from, because I was coming from keto, whereas if you're mm. coming from standard American, if someone switched to carnivore and did priming i know women that have lost weight just purely because they've switched from super inflammatory to yeah. you know i think they had a bumpy couple of days because i think we were going to talk about addictions that we find the most difficult to do when we switch to full carnivore and i think they found it bumpy for the first couple of days and mm. then uh, even though they were eating more whatever it was just came off and they had more energy straight away just because they were taking out the seed oils, the sugar, the I, whatever, the ice cream and, you know, eating actual proper food and getting proper nutrients as well. Yep, absolutely. Yes, I think so. So that's, that's priming in a nutshell. Mm. Um, that was my experience through the first two weeks of January last year, 2022. Mm. This year, the 90-day challenge actually starts in earnest and officially on the 9th of January in a week or so, five days from now. Yeah, that's good, because I bought you a present of alcohol. Yes, you did, you bad, bad girl. I know. Yes. And then also, according to you, I made you drink coffee, and we'll talk about that as well. About yes, when she made me, boys and I girls. Didn't. Yep, yeah, she did. She said, you, Field Marshal, I yes. guess. Or else I'm going to unleash Ted upon you. Yes. With his... And, uh, and various um, orifices and items were threatened. Yeah, various orifices and, or, were threatened. Organs and things. Yes. So Too many organs. The wetsuit with the bottom cut out and the bucket of soapy frogs, where I think was mentioned by Ted, among yeah, other things. Exactly. He said, you must drink this coffee. Um, yes. So anyway, that's, that's how that is. Anyway, we start in earnest. I've kind of started. I've, I've mostly knocked out the coffee. I did three and a half, four days or so without drinking coffee. From the first, I had uh, a couple of coffees today. Which um, is all my fault. Yes, of course. All Field Marshal Dr. Sarah's fault. And um, the all the, I mean, the, the occasional blueberries have gone. The, the excess cream that was being taken in with the coffee is gone. Mm -hmm. It's just beef and lamb and associated fat. And, and that's fine. And that'll be going on in earnest for 90 days, starting on the 9th, without the coffee and without the alcohol yeah. as well. And um, also, the other thing we were talking about is I said that when I've given up things, I found artificial sweeteners the hardest thing to give up because mm. that was I started drinking diet drinks when I was in my teens. And I think the, whatever you get addicted to first is yeah. the hardest one. Sure. So for anybody who wants to do the carnivore challenge and has is still drinking coffee and stuff. It doesn't mean they can't do it. I think we were talking about, you know, people going around saying carnivores, this religion that, you know, 
people can do carnivore and still have some coffee if they wanted to join in the 90 day challenge and that because everyone's in all different stages because obviously we've done it before several times and it's easy for social and family reasons to slip out of it so yeah i'm the same as you that with coffee that's what i have to give up i don't really drink alcohol but you know it's uh that's definitely out um i'm trying to think artificial sweeteners uh, i'm not a big cream fan anyway, but um, what do you think about dairy and things? Because I bought well, him some cheese and I, I ate some Parmesan earlier, the raw cheese, but you mm. mentioned you're t- cutting out the cream. Yeah. Um, well, there's those those excess heat units involved in the cream, those mm. calories oh, yes. that interfere with that calorie transport chain in the mitochondria. Yes. That's that conservation of mass issue that's going on there that's, yeah. that's a real problem. Um no, it's just the, the the cream comes out because the coffee's coming out, and yeah. the only time I have cream is with coffee. I'm not having coffee, so I'm not having cream. I think there's a little bit of carbs if you add up, and also oh, yeah. if you if people are not getting the results they want, if they're female, the first thing I look at is uh, I take out is dairy and right. cream. Mm. Maybe when someone's got a good circadian rhythm, you can possibly reintroduce some raw dairy later. But I would say that if it's not working for you, the cream. And I think Ken Berry's mentioned before a few times, I've heard him say, if you're doing keto or carnivore, it's not working, get the cream out. Yeah. Because then another thing I was going to talk about is that some people are then funny about butter because I brought, I always travel with coconut oil because I've been traveling around Vietnam and it's seed oil central. So I've mm. been using the coconut oil to flush it out because I'm traveling with my family. So what is your take on coconut oil in a carnivore diet? What would what would you say to me in or out or do whatever you like? Yeah, I think like with anything in the carnivore diet, we are not those of us that are reasonable and rational and sensible. Mm. We are not um puritanical we are we are not in some kind of cult we are not asking you to hand in your card and to front up mm-hmm. for public naming and shaming mm-hmm. it, it's an individual choice i just hope that people make their choices on the basis of a good robust and full education on the factors at play which would require a person to exercise their ability to use their own judgment to decide who they should listen to online and who should probably be ignored. Mm -hmm. Um, Let me give you a hand. Listen to me. Listen to Field Marshal Dr. Sarah Pugh. Listen to Dr. Ken Berry, Dr. Sean Baker, um, Dr. Anthony Chafee are all very, very good sources of correct, robust and sensible information. All very well credentialed, very well experienced, mature adult people with the right idea and the right approach. Uh, others, not so much. I'd like to add Paul Mason there. Oh, of course, and, yes. And um, Dr. Georgia Ead. She's a psychiatrist yes. who's Good. very knowledgeable, uh, and she's carnivore as Good. well. And there's also Dr. Rachel Brown in the UK who I'm going to drag onto your channel. I think I've put you in touch. She'll be a great person. She goes by Carnivore Shrink, so people who are interested in mental health and carnivore. And Dr. Rachel's got a book as well. So she's she's a shrink. She'll have a ball with me. Oh, yes, I know. Mm. But she's carnivore, so because she was, she didn't want to come on because she told me Bart's too intimidating. I said, well, she's, she's going to love you because you're not plant-based and you're not Lame Norton and you're not Greg Douchebag. And who else is there that's been a problem recently? Well, a number of people. Everybody's wrong on the interwebs except me, <laughs> apparently, according to some people. No, if she, thinks I'm, if she thinks I'm overly intimidating, perhaps she hasn't met our good friend, Field Marshal Lord Edward Yellow, mm. um, Ted of the Yellow, Yellow Ted. He's the real frightening one here. I'm quite surprised that you're quite happy to sit with Ted there. You know he bites, don't you? Um, yeah, but it looks like someone's bitten his eye out. Yeah, that was, that was some little fucker about 50 years ago who was then quite bald and once again, full circle is quite bald. Um, oh, is this your childhood Teddy? Oh, he was given to me by a, a now late aunt at birth. So oh, right. So you've slept with him lots oh, of times. Oh, many times, many times, but he doesn't kiss and tell. All right. He's just telling me the size <laughs> well, yeah. of the bed. Yeah, yeah. Of the bed. Yeah. Yes, the size of the bed. Good. Uh, anyway, before we got distracted, what were we talking about? Um, oh, co- coconut oil. Yes, coconut yes. oil. Because I, I think also um, there's a 
scientist I really like called Gerald Pollock, who's mm. written many papers and a book on structured water, which we'll get into when we talk about the mitochondria. And it's something in our bodies that the mitochondria make, and it's really important for health. Mm. And um, things like coconut oil and lard actually increase. He, he's published a paper on it. That's why when we talk about animal fat uh, and people try and tell you that lard's bad, mm. you know, it's all back in fashion. I mean, tallow's good as well, and that increases exclusion zone water, but also coconut oil does. But I think coconut oil also breaks down very readily into ketones. So again, it's going to please the mitochondria, which are going to not just make you ATP, but they mitochondria also make infrared, which anybody who's into infrared panels you can make your own infrared inside your own cells and heal from the inside as well. But also back to this structured water that the more goodies you put into the mitochondria, the more goodies you, they come out. Mm. And I don't think it's just about the ATP. I think there's a lot more to it, but we'll get into the deeper science later because I think we still haven't answered the question that what do you think about me having coconut oil instead of butter on my carnivore because I'm not great with dairy. Mm. And I think my circadian rhythm is pretty good now, but there are just some people that cream and dairy doesn't yeah. get on with. And what would you say for other people yeah. who no, might I, have I'm, trouble? I'm actually really happy with a person consuming coconut. I, I don't even call it coconut oil because it's not. It's a fat. Yeah. I call it coconut fat. Yeah. And I think it's perfectly okay. Uh, what most people don't understand is that coconut fat is actually more saturated than your average beef yeah. fat or whatever. It's 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 vastly more saturated. I think it's the most saturated. I think mm. um, what that and cacao butter, because things like lard and tallow, they're like 50-50, yeah. like our own body fat. And mm. coconut and palm oil, I think, is like more saturated than animal fat as well. But I think there's the ethics around palm oil. But then yeah. back to the coconut oil again. It seems to be that there are there are a few things in life that people agree on, but on the whole, most people seem to think coconut oil's all right. It's very stable mm. for cooking with. Because yeah. back to the seed oils again, you know, not they're not just massively high in deuterium, like two hundred ppm. If you heat them, they're just inflammation central. But mm. coconut oil is really versatile for cooking. So, mm. but of course, you know, saturated fat and heart disease. Yes. But then there are also people that are saying if you cook your meat, you're not carnivore. Is Isn't it that? Yeah. That is what so. we were talking about yes. earlier. And there are one or two people that are listening to these absolute buffoons yeah. and sucking down their ridiculous nonsense and then mindlessly regurgitating it mm -hmm. to their audiences, their shrinking audiences. Mm -hmm. Young man. Mm. Mm. Watch this space. Yeah. Um, that this whole idea that you must not cook your meat because cooking your meat destroys it. I mean, it's just ridiculous, isn't mm. it? What do you think? Well, wasn't there, wasn't it when we discovered fire and were able to cook our meat that there was a big jump in our intelligence? Some of us. Yeah, some of us. Mm. I think um, it's one of those things. I always eat liver raw just because I, because there's more, I know we have our own agreements about organs, but each of their own of what organs get put in each other's mouths. Yeah, indeed. Ask Frank about that. He'll tell yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so I never cook liver because there's there's loads of vitamins and things and stuff in that and it makes the room smell. And then I like my steaks rare, um, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't go and tell people, oh, if you cook your meat, it's shit. And I make oxtail soup and obviously you cook that for three hours. And mm -hmm. I just think it's com it's just it's up to people. So the idea of raw meat for some people is so terrifying. Mm -hmm. And for somebody new to carnivore, say if all their friends and family were like, what are you doing, weirdo? And they're eating raw meat as well. I think that's just a bit too much. Maybe later you might want to experiment with trying not cooking things as much, but it doesn't do anything. I mean, yes, there is vitamin C in meat. I think goose has got the most vitamin C. I remember I did a study okay. and um that's the only thing i think might you might uh, that's slightly heat label but other than that i mean a, lo a lot of the time a lot of people don't cook their meat properly anyway just naturally like i don't know anybody that likes their steaks really really heavily cooked most people oh dear oh sorry apologies it's all right now you do so yeah so well, I, uh, it's what Pim calls really, really well cooked. I'm trying to think of, any, I think also with the omega threes in meat. Um, but then we were going to talk about this before because, we, like you mentioned, you're going to just eat meat on your carnivore ninety days. But I'm quite mm. interested in getting DHA naturally because it's totally different. The supplements you buy 
I think you've published some papers on them. Yeah. Not only are they full of like chemicals, they're also not quite the same electron structure and they're not protected properly by the protein. So mm -hmm. you can either get your omega-3s from salmon roe. That's the best source. It's very expensive. Mackerel, salmon itself. And then we've got the grass-fed animals. So um, that's another one I think we might, that's like the coconut oil. Mm. What about people like me that really like fish? Um, what, what would you say about fish and, and the carnivore challenge? Yeah, I think fish is fine. Personally, I think that you wouldn't necessarily base your diet around fish and seafood as your staple. I still think that grass-fed ruminant muscle meat mm -hmm. and associated fat is the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd, I'd, you, know, you don't need to avoid fish. I think if you're going to eat fish, though, for preference, absolutely, it's fresh. Yeah. It's fresh caught that day if possible. Certainly, personally, I wouldn't eat any canned fish um, or, well, not canned in oil anyway. Oh, yeah. And um, also I think there's the aluminium, but... Well, that too. In the U it's all different in different countries. In the UK, the only wild salmon you can get is tinned, but then it's been heated, so the omega-3s mm. have probably been affected. But then... We were talking about plastic and heavy metals in yeah. fish, but yeah. the, the the heavy metals are more the big fish like tuna and swordfish and yeah. a delicacy in Sweden is rotten shark. And I think yeah. that's the highest mercury ever. But Schustruming, Schustruming it's called. But also, I don't want to put the fear of God into people about fish because there's procedures or precautions you can take with mercury because we humans and mercury have coexisted mm. forever because mm. it's in the Earth's crust. And yeah. I think. There are much more sinister things like glyphosate and chemicals we're not used to around and also the plastics in fish. Because I'm not an expert on microplastics and fish, but what do you know about that? And Very little other than it's there and it's believed to be a concern by some at this stage. Yeah, I've, I have looked into it a bit and I know that you can sort of detox and sweat them out. There's the Hubbard protocol, which is using flush niacin in a sauna for people that want to look it up. And yes, it's the same Ron Hubbard that you're thinking of, of mm. Scientologists. So we're not going to mention other sci of our favourite Scientologists. No, we're not going to mention Eric Berg. Yeah. And then, uh, so yeah, I think with, with every, you know, with, with things, the fish one, it's like, if the oceans and everything were cleaner, I'd probably eat more fish. I still eat it because mm -hmm. I think, you know, the DHA is important and I do like it and you have to source it properly, but yeah. you know, you have to be, and there's lots of minerals in the shellfish, but I think quite a few people have got allergies to seafood as well, haven't they? Yep. Absolutely. Yes especially to things like some of the particular myosin chains found in shellfish for some yeah, reason. Yeah, my mum's got it. Like she, my mum can't even have chondritin anymore, you know, the supplement right. for joints yep. because it's from shellfish. Yep. So, yeah, she can't. She has to be a bit careful. But then there are some people, I think me and you, I was talking to you about mitochondrial um, haplogroups. Yeah. And I'm like the Viking that sort of that should be eating um, seals and um, polar bears. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really like the cold weather. So I'm right up here and definitely shouldn't be eating carbs. And there are many, many other haplogroups. You can look it up yourselves or look if you've got a 23andMe test, it'll tell you and tell you all about it. Then you've got people on the equator, which are the L's, mm -hmm. and they're a bit more carb tolerant. So me being a sort of Viking hapless type, I am probably ancestrally more of a fish eater. But then there mm. would have been meat around, you know, yeah. that area because there's like large sort of would have been elk and stuff like that in sort of Finland and Scandinavian forests. Yeah. Mm. So, yes. Yes, yeah, so I have this image of you, Sarah, yeah. running around in the Scandinavian wilderness beating seals to death with your bare hands. And oh, stuff. yes, I'm sure mm. I could manage that. Yes, because mm. I suppose that was something else, because there's been lots of controversy a, a, a recently about people taking supplements and not admitting it. And mm. I think we were talking about, um, like, uh, uh, exercise and strength and stuff and how I'm still going strong in my mid 40s mm. and I think when I first when I did carnivore when I did gain some weight from it it was more from sort of uh, like I was exercising five times a week so people who say that you can't exercise and do strict keto I don't know where that's coming from neither so yeah yeah I don't know I wouldn't um, club any baby seals to death or anything before you start you know accusing me of stuff like that I just said I had an image of it. I didn't yes. really say you, you were doing it. There are certain people on the internet I feel like clubbing to death. But yes, me too. Yeah. We'll um, see a couple of examples of that this week if you haven't seen them already. Mm -hmm. mm. 
All right, so that covers that one off. I think um, seafood, yes, absolutely fine as part of a sort of reasonably balanced, sensible approach to carnivory. Um, this because I'm going through questions that my clients ask. Yeah. So definitely fish, dairy comes up. Another one mm. that came up earlier with me, you and Pim was sweeteners because. I was about to say something about stevia and Pim said, don't open your mouth. Mm. And then I think that's another one that sometimes people find they really struggle with, that they think, OK, I can give up, you know, bread and pizzas and stuff, but they just like their coffee with a sweetener. Yeah. So what's your thoughts? Oh, and actually, there was a paper um, that came out about two months ago, a massive meta study showing that artificial sweeteners um, do cause cardiovascular disease. But we know they're not safe anyway, but mm. it doesn't mean you can never have them. Yeah. It just there are people going around telling people that Diet Cokes are perfectly safe. Yeah. Whereas you still need to address caution and the science backs it. But I don't think Stevia was in that study. It was the chemical ones, the aspartame, yeah. sucralose. Yeah. A sulfame K, uh, but we've known this for ages, and I think mm -hmm. there was another paper about neurotoxicity. But these are probably people that are drinking two liters of diet coke a day, which we I come across this quite yeah. a lot. But back to the question about sweeteners, yeah. what would you say for people who want to do a carnivore challenge? But uh, as we've said, nobody gives a shit. No one's going to check. It's, I would always say I'd much rather people had a go yeah. and did and did it quite well than didn't try at all because mm. you know who's judging yep well what i would suggest is that i'm in the enviable position of not having a sweet tooth not mm. feeling like i need a sweet taste and i don't particularly need artificial sweetener um if someone is in a situation when they feel like they have an addiction situation to sweetness and feel that they could not live without sweetener they can certainly talk to Pim about that. That is her absolute wheelhouse in dealing with addictive situations mm -hmm. with food, substances, and stuff. I think, never mind the chemical shitstorm side of it, for mm -hmm. those ones that are chemical shitstorms, even the less problematic in that sense sweeteners are still problematic potentially, I find, in another way. And the reason I say that is it was a study I was involved in when I was working at the University of Auckland about ooh, 12 or 13 years ago now. Mm. And what was found in that study was that when subjects were given a sweet tasting fluid, whether that was sugar or whether it was artificial, mm they were to swill it around in their mouth for 10 seconds mm -hmm. and then spit. Mm -hmm. um, and not swallow. And exactly. Mm -hmm. Spitting, not swallowing was mm -hmm. the instruction. Mm -hmm. um, Frank wasn't one of those okay. in, in the study. He wasn't a part of it. Yeah. Um, in any case, what we found was that when the sweet taste was detected by the taste buds, mm -hmm. within seconds we were able to detect a release of insulin oh yeah i've read that one but also um artificial sweeteners can also interfere with leptin as well too. yep and a lot of people um, become leptin resistant before being insulin resistant mm. i know there's a de debate about this there was a paper that they tried to say there's no effect if you eat artificial sweeteners with food yeah. or, or it was it was non-conclusive but that study mm. was if you have artificial sweeteners in the absence of anything else your body thinks you've eaten sugar therefore it'll produce insulin mm. drop your blood sugar and you'll probably go off and eat a donut yeah that was or for some people it's just releasing insulin for no reason yeah so now it should also be said that that study the purpose of that study was to find out whether mm. that reaction to the sweet taste was sufficient to improve power output on a cycle erg Oh, right, okay. And it did, either way, actually. Right. What happened was the brain sensed the taste of sweetness on the tongue, mm -hmm. and two things happened immediately. Number one, the voluntary power output on the cycle erg went up. Yep. And number two, insulin was released. Yeah. So basically it thought, you know... Whether it was sugar or artificial. Yeah. Mm. Oh, no, definitely. And I think for some people who struggle with sugar addiction, the same part of the the um, of the brain, the dopamine center, can get activated. So somebody who's trying to give up sugar, if you carry on having artificial sweeteners, you're never going to quite kick that sort of sweet desire. And mm -hmm. I had that for ages. And, and, you know, it's 
it, it's easier to give up artificial sweeteners than sugar. So I don't. I think for mm. somebody who is coming from a background where they are addicted to sugar, I don't think it matters if they move on to sweeteners because it's the. Le- I, I don't want to say lesser of two evils because I don't want them to be stuck on that forever, but. Yeah. It, it, they serve their place in society for helping people, sure, sure. but like I think, um, like you said, it, it, even stevia makes your brain think you've eaten something sweet. Like kept by a neuro, neurologically with the dopamine and yeah. biochemically with the insulin. Yes, yeah. So it's not a free pass. Yeah, the the, the artificial sweeteners. I I think I, I agree that it's probably better than to pour sugar down your neck. Mm-hmm. Nonetheless, if you are not able to redress that situation and to retrain your taste buds to enjoy savory and not need everything sweet, yeah. then I would talk to Auntie Pim yeah. or Professor Fluffy, who's just telling us all about it in the background now. Woof, 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 she says. Yeah, but that's the thing, I think, also with just over-flavouring food altogether. It just make, there's just too much of a dopamine flood. Mm. But it's like everything in stages, you know, it's yeah. like... I know people will say, oh, I tried keto. Oh, I know who it was, Durian Rider. I tried keto for a three, was it a day or three yeah, days? A whole day. Yes. A whole day, Harley. And, and therefore it doesn't work because, yeah. you know, but I think that's. You've got to carb the fuck up, Sarah. You've got to carb the fuck up. That's what you've got to do. Yeah. I think it's like, you know, I'd rather people did it quite well if I'm working with someone because people are too hung up about perfection. And it, like, it took me years to get things right, you know, and there's mm. still stuff I do wrong. And it's like, just give it a go. And I think I was going to come back to the meat again because not everyone likes beef and what if people can't afford it? What if, because we yep. just fitted it as a chicken farm earlier. So what yep. are your views on different meats? Because I mentioned goose is like one of the most nutritious, but it's also the most expensive and the most rare. Yep. So in terms of people who want to do the carnivore and either beef's too expensive or they don't like it, what do you think about lamb? Because I'm pretty keen on that. Yeah, I love lamb. Lamb is secondary in the hierarchy of meat intakes in this house. Mm-hmm. We base our intakes around beef, and it's probably 80% right. of beef. And lamb is second, and then various cuts of pork, including bacon, occasionally, is is in the mix. And then very, very far behind all of that is the seafood and the chicken and any other form of poultry and, and all of that way down the list. What do you think about things like venison? Because we're back in the UK, mm. my mum and I bought quite a lot of game boxes. So with that's yeah. you know, we've got you get things like rabbit and venison and you get partridge and yeah. um sort of thing and my mum loves goose. Mm. So I think it's like that uh, those yeah. kind of birds are totally different to those chickens we saw out there with the white meat. I know chickens have got quite a lot of puffers in them. Not that puffers are going to kill you, but I think mm. there are a variety of reasons why you have to yeah. be a bit careful of chickens, yeah. but I'll let you go into yeah. it. But again, yeah, Of course, of course yeah. those chickens that live across the road, across here that we visited earlier, they are not food chickens, they're yeah. egg chickens. Yep. And they are actually fed on nonsense, frankly. Yeah. It's, it's granulated chicken chow stuff they're allowed to roam free and to dig around in the dirt and get their own things as but well they're classed as free range because the laws yeah. just change in new zealand that yeah. all caged hens eggs are now banned so yeah. everything has to be free range so yeah. i was really curious to see what is free range because there's always loopholes in the law with farming and like mm. you said we don't know what they're actually eating yeah yeah so those chickens live in barns with open doors. Well, the doors are open during the day. Mm. They tend to come in by themselves at night time. We've been down there around about nightfall and seen them mm. all just wander inside. The doors are closed at night mm. to keep any nasties out, I guess, and to keep the chickens in. Mm. And then the next morning they come out again and they free range and whatever, and they're, they're fed additionally in large containers that trucks come up and just pour this stuff into bins and they, could, they just get in there and do their thing and climb over each other and pick each other and yeah anyway so that's that my mum used to keep chickens and she, back then she had to order antibiotic free pellets especially yeah. so there's always like you know issues with chicken meat because um, with cows, you're, if it's pasture fed, it really is pasture fed. You're yeah. not going to get that. Well, I think there's a lot of loopholes in chicken farming. Mm. Yeah. So they've just closed that down here in New mm. Zealand in terms of the caged poultry. Mm. 
eggs from caged chickens, no longer okay. What Fol about um, eating cage? Uh, is it all banned completely, so no more battery hens at all in New Zealand? My, that's my understanding. Whether I've got that right or not remains to be seen, but I think that's yes, what I thought does. that. Yeah. I thought it was like, a, it's an animal welfare thing. Yes, and as a result of that, there is a short-term egg shortage until they can reinvigorate the free-range um, chicken farming enough in this country to subserve the supply, which currently does not meet demand. So there you go. But we're lucky because we live right next to the chicken farm. Not that we can jump over the fence and grab any eggs or anything like that, but yeah, yes. the local supermarkets have all had eggs in. Whereas just over the hill in Christchurch on the other side of the island, there's no eggs in the No eggs to be had, apparently. Hmm. So there's that. Um, I, I think they're okay to eat as part of the diet. But I mean, keep in mind again that what I'm talking about is a diet that is 80, maybe 85% beef mm -hmm. and associated fat, muscle meat, mm -hmm. by the way. The entire rest of the 15% that's left, probably 10% of that is lamb, mm -hmm. and the remaining 5% is pork, poultry. And in, in, in my case, eggs. I hardly eat any eggs at all. I don't actually do well with eggs. Yeah. I, there is a limit to the number of eggs I can eat before I get the shits, basically, and stomach ache, and it's just a thing with me. I think everyone's different because I think, like, an egg is quite a, a go-to because when I was in Vietnam, I had to eat more eggs than I wanted to just because mm. I'd rather eat that because, there's like, for breakfast, there's no way you'll get me eating croissants and like fruit and stuff like my mum and dad do because I thought I'd be all right with the fruit because it was grown locally and seasonally but then because of my mitochondrial haplotype the viking one mm. even um if I grow apples in my own garden if I eat too many my blood sugar's not happy and yep. it's just you know like I said if you let the viewers you know if they if they want to know more about these mitochondrial haplotypes mm. they can look it up we can make another video but I think it's back to you know I I I haven't had any eggs. Actually, haven't had any eggs since I got here mm. because of the shortage. So mm. I think it's one of these things. It's with carnivore. Some people view it as very restrictive. Yeah. And I have seen people making omelets with like twelve eggs, and then certain people are really into butter. And like that's why I brought up the coconut oil because some people uh, don't get on with it. And mm. yep. um, I, I've um, pork in the UK used to be terrible, like used to be grey, but they've had a massive improvement and you can get some really nice sort of wild reared pork. But then what's your reasoning behind um, not eating too much pork? Is it just you don't like it or is it, is there another? Yeah, it's just the way that it, it works out with, mm. with what the way that we've decided to do it. Um, Pim eats more bacon than I do. Mm. I hardly eat any bacon at all. Mm -hmm. um, Pim also eats a lot more eggs than I do. Mm -hmm. For the reasons we've just discussed, um, we we love slow cooked ribs, pork mm. ribs. They're great. Yeah, yeah. I think um, pork belly can be really helpful for yep. people um, who are struggling with food addiction because it's so fatty. It kind yeah. of fills people up. But that's again, you can talk to Pim about stuff like that. But yep, absolutely. It's always it's always people try and say you know um, pork belly and then avocados for. Um, keto, but then mm. with avocados, they don't grow in the UK. So I think, right. I, well, I'd never eat them, but mm. they do grow in um, in New Zealand now, don't they? We're in a we're in a big avocado growing area here. Yes, mm. and that, it, uh, that and grapes. Because I think it's what I was hinting at is people are always going to cheat, and if they want to eat fruit and vegetables, if you can get it seasonal and local, you know that's yeah. like the quantum view, mm. and it's like each of their own. I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't. It's just you know I personally if i'm in the uk the worst thing i can possibly eat is a pineapple on christmas day because yeah. whereas if it's an, a, an apple i've grown in my own garden because sometimes they flower in december maybe half would be okay but i think it's just for people who are transitioning from something else mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on somebody who because i think pim's you know she goes keto and then carnivore say yeah. if someone's listening and they um can't do carnivore but they don't want to do paleo it's not working what would you say they could eat i know that you know it's not it's contraindicated and we don't actually need fruit and vegetables and mm. what about if someone wanted to transitions what would you suggest yeah I, I tend to take people at face value where they are yeah and if they are having issues transitioning Mm. I try to get to the bottom of what I think the, the metabolic issues are, mm -hmm. and I try to find a route, a subterfuge mm. around to closer to a hundred percent. From wherever someone is, it's you know any improvement towards a hundred percent 
carnivore is a win, mm -hmm. and I will take it with a client yeah. that is having issues. By the same token, I also play a bit of good cop, bad cop as well mm. by saying, you know, obviously this is your decision and you have to make this call. It's, it's your self-discipline that's at play here, et cetera, et cetera. But you cannot negotiate with this. Yeah. You cannot, you know, say I'm different, I'm special somehow. I can pour 400 grams of carbohydrate down my stupid neck every day of my life and I'll get away with it. Yeah. And so will you. It's fine. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So long as you live equatorially and surf three hours a day and then weight train on top of that, as well as being very, very physically active and um, quite muscularly developed. Uh, but never mind any of those things. It's perfectly fine. Pull that sugar down your neck, boys and girls. Go for it. And, and that's fine. That, that's not OK. Because I think as a woman, I can't walk around shirtless and I'm. You know, it would be lovely to swim in the sea well, can every day. Sure. Yes. Oh, oh. Swim in the sea every day and ground. And yeah. it's all back to, yes, he does live on the equator and the fruit he's buying grows locally to Costa Rica. Yeah. Um, but, you know, each of their own. It's just I'm more, well, it, maybe it works for him. but um, Well, it, 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 he purports that it works for him. But anybody with a pair of eyeballs that can compare Paul Saladino today with Paul Saladino, even two or three years ago, yeah. visually, will go, oh, shit. Is yeah. it working for you, Paul? Mm. Really? But I think that was, again, we were, something else we were talking about was, you know, if you, if you want to take things, just be honest about it. But anyway, mm. we've digressed because um, I know what you think about organs and liver kings and, mm. you know, putting organs in your mouth. We mm. Obviously, Bart and I have our own, like, different opinions, and one day we should have a debate. Uh, we, I know I don't believe, we neither of us believe in friendly debates, mm. but... Mm. There's not much we don't disagree on, but I think there's a few things because I still eat, I sometimes eat liver and heart, but yeah. what's your reasoning? Do you just not like it or do you think it's too easy? Because Liver King used to eat liver every day. Yeah. When I looked it up, because I had to get a client to eat, it was complicated, but the um, where I looked said no more than 100 grams a week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My take on it is, number one, that the, the primary driver, if you like, for me personally on not eating pretty much any liver at all, ever, mm -hmm. is that I do not like the taste of it. Okay. I do not enjoy it. I will partake of a little bit of liver pate when Pim makes it, because she makes a very good one herself. Mm. Um, she does that quite rarely, and when she does, I'll probably have a little bit of that. It's, mm. That's fine. Beyond that, the risk, if there is a risk, although it's not established, it's not, it's not proven by any stretch, there are no studies on this, but if there is a risk, it's in the huge concentration of copper that you will find in liver. And vitamin A. Well, yeah, and, and there is the risk of vitamin, vitamin A. It's got a half-life of about um, yeah. three or four months, but I think yeah. it's, you get, if you eat too much vitamin A naturally, I think you can... More, you you can excrete it better, and you mm. start to just not want the liver anymore. Yep. But I think because I interrupted because the copper thing, I think that can creep up on you insidiously. Yes, I think I think it, that's that's what makes the liver far more insidious is a good yeah. word than than the vitamin A thing. Mm -hmm. And as such, it can lead you to all sorts of electrolyte imbalances, which can all have you know a milieu of sequelae involved. Mm -hmm. Uh, including things like not being able to control your electrolytes, Paul, mm. thus leading you to the false belief that the only way to solve this is to pour 400 grams of carbohydrates down your stupid neck every day. Mm. Um, not a good idea at all. Um, when you think about it, let's say you and I were in a tribe and we took down a mammoth or mm -hmm. more, more recently a cow, mm -hmm. say. Think about how much of that the edible meat on that cow, mm -hmm. think about how much of that is liver. Yeah. To me, if a person chooses to eat liver, that's fine. You know, I'm not going to... Do you mean if there was 20 of us in a tribe and yeah. we all shared the liver, we'd get a tiny piece? Exactly. If we shared that beast out evenly yeah. in terms of the proportion of muscle meat versus anything else, liver included, you'd get a very small piece of mm -hmm. liver. It wouldn't be huge. And that one cow would probably be taken down twice a month. Yeah. Something like that. Mm -hmm. That would be the indicated level of liver in a human diet. Mm -hmm. 
as per the natural selection pressure of how we've lived mm-hmm. for me. Um, now, there are those that absolutely swear by liver and say, no, no, eat much more liver than that. Eat heaps of liver. It's great for you. It's fine. But if you follow these characters for, say, even two or three years, what happens to them? Mm. But also some of the people saying this are dishonest about other things. So why should yeah. I believe that they're even eating that much liver a day? And You're kidding. The man was on the juice. And then it's like, that's what it, that's what I mean about, you know, I'm, I've tried like pretty much everything on the planet and I'm honest, I honestly never deny anything and I don't pretend to, but mm-hmm. then I don't go around starting businesses and pretending that people need things. Cause what are your thoughts on kind of desiccated organ tablets? Do you think we need them? Do you think not? No, not necessary. As I say, I, I consume exactly no liver on average per day, per week, per month. I would have liver maybe once a year if you're lucky yeah. in some pate. What do you think? I suppose if, if the liver is the main detox organ in the body, do you think if you're desiccating liver, there's mm. a risk you, you could have all kinds of chemicals in there and you've basically freeze dried this liver into a tablet? Because yeah. when, when you buy these desiccated organ supplements, how well tested are they? Because I know quite a lot about the British testing system of supplements and where really anal, whereas what's mm. the American testing? Are they lab tested? You mm. know, does anybody know? Not, I'm not really au fait with the American testing system so much. Would you say, because the thing is, there could be anything in the liver, whatever's been detoxing. Mm, yeah. and, and anything when you're obviously working in a lab, you're basically freeze drying down. We used to yeah. condense proteins and everything down. Yeah. So it, you, you could potentially be concentrating goodness knows what. I'm not you yeah. know, making any accusation. I'm just asking out of curiosity. Mm. Is there any kind of, you know, when you buy some supplements now like CBD, you can demand a lab test because yeah. you need to know whether there's THC in it because obviously a pilot could get sacked. And I think yeah. there are like certain um, third party testings because there are certain supplements that contain nasty things, mm. but we don't know the full extent of it. But yeah. I'm just thinking aloud here about. Yeah. Okay, I think it's entirely possible. I don't know the American system, as I said, I, I yeah. Maybe maybe someone can leave a comment underneath the video. We don't know. Yes. While you're there, don't forget to hit the like button mm-hmm. because studies show the single largest cause of metabolic dysfunction is failure to hit the like button. Mm-hmm. It's also the single largest cause of late night visits from Yellow Ted. Right, okay. And he will bring his fluffy yellow truncheon. Uh, yes. Not to mention the wetsuit with the bottom cut out and his bucket of soapy frogs. Okie dokes. And, and what about the hamsters? That. Well, the hamsters, exactly. I, I, I think we have a shortage of hamsters here. I think Frank has, has um, consumed them all. There is such a thing called hamstering, you know. Yes. I've heard of it. Yes. It sounds horrific to me. Yeah, so back to horrific things. Yes. Um, well, I was telling you about bra- uh, brains and, and China, because I know some mm-hmm. people have asked me about offal before. I personally haven't eaten it because I just don't, there isn't anywhere I live. But in China, they like to eat live monkeys and they, t- they chain them up under the table and it's still alive and they cut the top of the head off with a electrical device and eat the brain live Ooh, god but that's a whole thing i know there's lots of dha or um whatever other nutrients what's your thoughts on offal because my i used to have a lodger who used to love offal and then yeah. it obviously got banned in the uk for a long time because of bsc and stuff yeah yeah so yeah. i don't know what's your thoughts on that um i'm okay with it as a small part as a small addition to the diet um it's not something that appeals to me mm. i don't particularly run around eating brains any more than liver or, or entrails or testicles, testicles, ears, noses or assholes, frankly. Oh, yeah, I bought yeah. a um, pig snout when I was here. Yes, that was funny. We went to the butchers on the way from the airport back to the meat militia headquarters at an undisclosed location. Yeah. Just by Matafaka here in New Zealand, which is um, not too far away from the city of Nelson. Yes. Matafaka. Is, that, is, is that actually what it's called? No, I just made that up. All right, okay. It's a, it's a bit of a joke because it makes it sound like a Maori place name. Right. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, they do have lots of titi kakas. Yes, and, yes, yes. And, and waifaka mukau. Yes, and yes. And places like that. Yes. Yes. Um, no, I'm, I'm okay with You people. distracted me. Where, where were we? Because it was a really important question. Brains. Yes, that's it. Brains. Yes, yes. yes. Um, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm not okay with monkeys having their heads cut off no, while they're still room, living. I, think I don't think that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm okay with eating brains in, as a general thing in, in, in you know, a, a small portion. It's not something I do, but I wouldn't 
I wouldn't ask someone for their carnival card back if, if they chose to, frankly. Um, there are those that talk about eating nose to tail, and I usually ask those people, well, how was the last nose you tasted? Was yes. it a tasty nose? Well, actually, we did. That's why I got so excited at the snout, because I once mm. saw, I found jellied uh, reindeer nose when I went to Lapland. But other mm. than another nose that's edible, uh, those snouts, is they're, they're for dog chews, by the way. We're not having pig snout for tea. So, um, mm. yes. And then I think it was back to other weird food, because in Vietnam, they're really into chicken feet. But that's the same with Hong Kong and China. So yeah. I think that's their version of sort of uh, the, the, the glycine and the collagen and stuff. And yeah. I'm, I don't have a problem with that, really, yeah. because it's a waste otherwise. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, and, you know, I know people went through a big phase of putting glycine on their steak to balance the methionine out. What's yeah. your thoughts on that? Because I eat oxtail and... I like gelatinous things anyway, and I'm not a massive steak eater. Even though, like, mm. I, I, you know, it, we have good. I have good quality. But in your view, what, what's yeah. your view on the collagen and the glycine and the methionine? My, my view on, if, if you mean any additional or supplemental use of any of these kind of amino acids or, or any of that kind of preparation, mm. I would only ever suggest to anybody that they should supplement with any of those things if there is a demonstrated deficiency or symptomology that would support that line of action. Mm -hmm. I work under the assumption that everything we need can be found in the muscle meat of large ruminant animals, even if it's well done, even if it's cooked right through, it's still there. Um, even taurine, which I'm told I can't get, mm -hmm. well, I don't have any deficiency symptoms of taurine. Sorry, Harry, but I don't. Um, and if I do take additional taurine at all, what happens is within a few days, I start to stink the house out with sulfuric emissions, mm -hmm. telling me that what's happening is my body is desulfating that taurine and transmuting it to other things to clear it from my body because it doesn't need it. Mm -hmm. Oh no! Well, the things if we start to talk, if we start talking about sulfur and sulfate, that'll go off in a big rabbit hole. But that's, I think it's one. It's one of these um, topics that, like you said, if you're experiencing symptoms mm. like smelling of sulfuric acid or basically shitting yourself if you're eating loads of eggs, you're doing something wrong. Mm. And I think that's how a lot of people eventually work things out because I'm. I'm not for all this. Oh, I tried it for three weeks at carnivore and keto shit. It didn't work. You've mm. got to give it a chance. Yeah. And there's, as you probably, if you've been listening to this, there's so many permutations and combinations of how you could do carnivore. Yes. And there is still meats and things and animals and stuff that I saw in Vietnam. We haven't even started discussing. I think I said we ate jellyfish. Mm. So there's like, you know, uh, and there's animals. I'm sure people in the comments can comment about what's the most unusual animal or thing they've seen or eaten. Mm. What's the most unusual organ you've put in your mouth? Yes. Frank Tufano, we yes. don't want your answer. Anybody else can answer. We know what you've been putting in yours, Frank. But then even um, with to do with McDonald's and their burgers, because aren't they legally bound to have to have, it has to be 100% beef. Yeah. So I know it could, it could include arseholes and, yeah. you know, um, muscle meat as well and they don't fry it in seed oil so if somebody was traveling and they wanted to stay carnivore i mean i hate mcdonald's as a company but say if someone was really stuck yeah it is actually 100 percent beef by law and there's no yes. seed oils around yes. so if they were stuck they could eat mm. that and that probably would be nose to tail because yeah. i don't know even though it's 100 percent beef it does it's not you're not going to be getting prime steak in that no and no, you're I probably going to get some organs and, like I said, other interesting yeah. And also bits. you'll find that they use a mix which is low in fat because of this fat phobia. Oh, yeah. I was talking to a client yesterday, actually, who is a young bloke who's just out of home and doesn't have time or mm. want to cook and prepare food and stuff for himself or to even, in, you know, go to the supermarket on a weekly basis and buy food and mm. store it in the house and whatever. He actually eats out two meals a day, every day. And what he does is he goes into the local McDonald's where he lives and he mm. says, I'll have X number of patties, please. Cook yep. those up. I don't want the buns or any of that. Yeah, yeah. Else. Just cook those patties. Put them in a box. I don't care how much it costs. Don't tell me you can't do it. Just fucking do it. And that's what he eats. Nothing else. It's actually so, um, cost effective for people yeah. who are on a lower income. Yeah. And you're guaranteed no seed oils mm. and it's going to be beef. But yeah. yeah, I've heard that. But what I suggested to him was yeah. add more fat yeah. somehow. Get some butter into that or something because that will be too lean. 
Because I think that was my issue with the with the game with the with the um, with the deer and stuff. Oh yes, because yeah. um, the venison and kangaroo and stuff like yeah. that. Because my dad's just been visiting his sister because she they own a three hundred cow farm mm. and there were kangaroo. You can eat kangaroo there, and he said it's like venison. And I think, like you said, you can end up with too much protein, and then for women, we maybe we'll go into it, maybe we won't. You can end up obviously with cortisol issues and insulin issues mm. um, because again of the fat phobia, but. That's back to the fat thing, because I think, you know, if someone wants to add fat, you can buy tallow, lard, mm. coconut oil, cacao butter, uh, and then butter. And it, because of the amount of energy in them or heat, mm. uh, they're actually quite cheap. So I think it's up, like you said, it's up to him, whichever his favorite fat is. I mean, actually, you can get goose and duck fat in the shops as yeah. well, and it's going to last you for a long time. And mm. tallow is pretty, pretty, there's a mixture of prices. Yeah. Because which one? Because I know you and Pim. You, what have, I've seen coconut oil and butter here. Yep. We've also got jars and jars and jars of rendered lard, yes. tallow, and stuff from the meats that we've been cooking. That's a good point, actually. Someone, because I've got an air fryer now, and somebody asked me once, "What do I do with the fat that comes off?" Because mm. I don't want to waste it. And I think that's a really good point. Rather mm. than paying money for buying a fat in the shop, you can just store that and. Yep. Yep, so we have jars and jars of that. In mm -hmm. fact, at one point recently, we got to a point where the infantry of that was so much that we thought we're never going to get through this. So Pim made some candles. Oh, really? Mm. There's all sorts. You can make soap as well with it. Yep. Like yep. in Fight Club, one of my favorite films. Mm. Have you watched that? You yeah, know, well, the, never first, talk about... the first rule is never talk about Fight yes. Club. Yes. Exactly, because yeah, Tyler Durden made soap. So, yeah. Yeah. Of course, the first rule of the Mean Militia is you never stop talking. About yes. the meat militia. Yes. The second rule of the meat militia is you never stop talking about the meat militia. Mm -hmm. That's the same rules as they have for CrossFit and for being a cyclist and for being a vegan. Yes. They're the same rules for those people too. We stole them. Well, there's plenty of other people that will tell you straight away about it. Mm -hmm. We won't go into it. Just yes. to, people can work it out for themselves. Yes. Indeed. So what else do we want to talk about today? I think just uh, I think um, I touched on leptin because some people um, have been doing diets and carnivore and stuff and are still stuck. And I was saying about leptin being a circadian hormone. So that's mm. where you get into, you know, getting up and seeing the sunrise to set your hormones for the day and then getting UVA at um, that's like UVA light. It comes out around about seven to nine a.m. You need to check your region. That will help you make um, um, serotonin, thyroid and stuff to set you up for the day. Mm. And then because um, I'm talking about light now and people are thinking, what the hell are you going on about? Well, leptin is made in your fat, which is under your skin mm. and light can penetrate and also leptin circadian. So if your body clock's all over the place, you're going to have problems with your leptin. So that would be the first thing I'm just explaining to people briefly how to set up a quantum day. I mean, you could do a whole episode on this. So they'd see the sunrise, get out in the morning to get the UVA. If it's UVB season for making vitamin D, obviously get out in that. There isn't any in the UK at the moment. Then it's the bedtime routine. So it would be about blocking and minimizing blue light. And then because if you start eating... Um, late in the evening, you're going to disturb your leptin and it's going to misinform your brain about how much energy you've got for the day. So again, it's about um, if you're eating before bed or uh, people who are quite really strict, I'm going to be more strict about it when I get back to the UK of not eating after sunset. That's not practical for some people, but definitely four hours before bed. And I think Bart and I, because we're just cooking dinner, I was asking him, what time do you normally eat? And you, you eat, you know, it's past your dinner time yeah. now, isn't it? Yeah. So, Although subserving the needs of the meat militia and their viewing entertainment is more important. Yes. So, but I think we're on the same page there that, mm. you know, sometimes people, things work for people. They don't understand why. And yeah. then I always have to understand in every tiny detail, why did this happen? Why did that happen? And I think sometimes if people are doing OMAD and say having their dinner at, um, say, five or six o'clock, that's miles away from bedtime. Yeah. I won't go into the discussion about eating in the morning and fasting because I think that's just a whole other video and topic. And yeah. we've talked about enough. But I think you just reminded me something about things working and us not understanding why. And when I was really into ketogenic diets and why fats are better fuel than glucose, it's first of all, it's got more electrons to go down the electron transport chain. Mm -hmm. Then we were talking earlier about how complex one and two in the 
uh, a mitochondria a leaky, as in um, free radicals escape, and the electrons from the fat go straight to complex two, so you get a cleaner burn. Mm. But um, when you get electrons from glucose, they go down complex one, two. So it's a bit like, uh, well, I would say it was like chucking paper on the fire. You get a bit of a woof mm. and, you know, more inflammation. But then yeah. you were talking about there's a more of a deeper subtlety to this about FAD and NAD, about yeah. why if we want to talk quantum and, and protons, uh, electrons and stuff, there are like quantum physics reasons why fat's a better fuel, not just us making shit up because yeah. we're, we've got an agenda. Mm. Yeah, it is a very interesting one. And I've been challenged by a number of young Dunning-Kruger sufferers with actually no real background to speak of or no mm. experience in this field whatsoever who some reason believe that their opinion is just as valid and know more about this than I do for mm. some reason. Um, and they're saying this ridiculous idea that when you oxidize fat more so than carbohydrate, more of the electrons are delivered to the electron transport chain on the FAD transporter, co-transporter, and less on the NAD transporter. And as such, that overloads complex two in the electron transport chain, meaning there's a backflow or back leakage, mm -hmm. they call it, of electrons back to the um, coenzyme Q10, thus back onto enzyme onto the complex one, thus producing a bunch of reactive oxygen species, they say. And that's the reason why we should oxidize carbohydrates absolutely and avoid fats, because we don't want to be producing all these reactive oxygen species. There are several issues with that frankly ridiculous idea. Mm. One. Reactive oxygen species at a certain level are hormatic, hormetic, are indicated, and are actually signaling molecules to other systems in the body, upregulating their function such that the function holistically in the organism is designed for the evil machinations, for the best means of that organism. The whole idea that we don't want to produce reactive oxygen species because they're bad is ridiculous and so, reductionist. And it can also, it's important for triggering autophagy and apoptosis as well. It's yeah. like a firework display. Yes. It's like a beacon that you do need them. If you if we mm. got rid of all free radicals, we wouldn't be able to fight off infections. Correct. And, you know, it's, um, yeah, so I've I've heard that. And also the yeah. backflow of electrons. Mm. I, I've never heard that before. Yeah, that's the way they're describing it. And that's yeah. the second problem with the idea that backflow of electrons is a problem causing this vast, they say, increase in reactive oxygen species production. And mm -hmm. it's this. When you oxidize more fat and less carbohydrate, more of the electrons that are liberated by the beta oxidative process are delivered to the electron transport chain directly to number two complex via the FAD comma, and less, relatively, are delivered to complex one by NAD. So to say that the backflow of electrons therefore causes the production of more reactive oxygen species doesn't work, does it? Because you've increased one thing and commensurately decreased the other thing, such that the net overall balance of electrons being delivered into the chain is the fucking same. Does that make sense to... Mm -hmm. Yeah. To anyone with more than three brain cells? But also, it's making the assumption that people would be over-consuming fat, mm. um, which they're not. And if people's hormones and everything are working properly, they're not going to be over-consuming fat anyway because mm. they just won't be hungry. And what, where would these extra electrons to go backwards down? I've never heard a reverse electron transport mm. chain. But then on the same other topic about me the pro-metabolic people, don't they like to say that, well, you need to eat lots of sugar to lower your cortisol? Mm. Well, I would say if you've got a cortisol problem, you've probably got a circadian rhythm problem. So why not fix that yeah. properly with light, uh, going to bed um, at a proper time, blocking blue light, getting up, seeing the sunrise? You don't need you shouldn't be trying to lower cortisol using carbohydrates. Because yes. I've heard that argument so many times. Yeah. And I think it's here's another doozy they come up with. Yeah. You should eat lots of sugar because that produces more carbon dioxide and oh, okay, carbon dioxide is indicated and a good thing to have more of in your system, they say. Well, there's a problem with that too. Mm -hmm. 
the level of carbon dioxide capacitated by the human body is not an independent variable. You cannot alter the level of carbon dioxide capacitated in the human body by changing the amount of carbon dioxide being produced. That mm -hmm. won't work. Le Chatelier's principle. Mm -hmm. Whoops. Fucking idiots. Yep. We weren't going to slag people off. No, we weren't. We haven't mentioned any names, but also, again, well, with, we have. with the CO2 one, you know, there's lots of um, breathing techniques that yeah. I think sometimes, rather than making up excuses to eat carbs about carbon dioxide, why not learn proper breathing techniques mm. if you've got issues with your gases yep. <laughs> of any kind, mm. rather than trying to just delude people to tell them that if you eat these carbs, it's going to lower your stress. Mm. Because it's just, yeah, who doesn't feel good eating carbs? But I just think it, I, it really upsets me because it's, mm. um, I'm not going to mention any names, but there was a psychiatrist talking about ADHD saying, oh, I need to make, the, these people need to eat carbs every couple of hours to keep their blood sugar up. And then people with ADHD are given an amphetamine-based sort of medication. And that's going to have a lot, it has a half-life of about 12 hours. So they're not sleeping properly. So the circadian rhythm's messed up. I'm not for one minute saying I don't not believe in ADHD. I think genuinely there are lots of cases and some of it people have got a misdiagnosis. But for a psychiatrist to be telling somebody, oh, you need to eat sugar every couple of hours. And then then in the same in the same sort of conversation, he said, oh, lots of people with ADHD have got a weight issue. Mm. And it's like, well, if you're telling people to eat carbs every three or four hours to keep their blood sugar up because they're ADHD, you're just feeding, creating the problem. Yeah. Anyway, that's the other it issue is. I've got about the pro-metabolic. I mean, I agree with a lot of the stuff, uh, like as in the puffers mm. and there's, you know, about the there's lots of interesting things about pregnenolone and thyroid. I just think telling people to eat that much carbs, or mm. in my case, this particular doctor that I don't agree with, um, telling people, I think eating lots of carbs regularly is like just as bad, well, even worse than eating a great big ton of it all at once. But Absolutely. Who, who, who are we? Who am I to say? Well, I don't know. Anyway, look, it's been an absolute delight and a pleasure to host you in the flesh. Yes. In the Meet Militia studio. And Ted's really enjoyed sitting on your lap, so he has. Yes, he has. He's told me all about, you know, what you got up to in your bed. I, I know. And usually it's Ted that's behind the scenes twiddling all the knobs. Oh, um, yes. Yes. I so, know. I've had him on my lap. Yeah, you know, so he's... he wouldn't have been able to twiddle any knobs then, would he? No. No. Well, well, Ted, he's, yes. he's deprived. Yeah. Anyway, look, Sarah, thank you very much, A, for your time. Thanks for flying halfway around the world, especially yeah. to sit in the Meet Militia studio and record this video. That's the only reason you came to New Zealand, exactly. of course. Yes, I came for, I flew all the way for one day and I'm going back tomorrow. That's it, yes. yes. So thank you for that. Thank you also for being a good sport and put, getting yourself into appropriate Meet yes, Militia uniform. you wanted me to dress up, mm. so yes. Yes, appropriate uniform. Yes. I, I had a different uh, little outfit in mind for Sarah, but she wasn't game. Oh no, he wanted me to dress up in the blue one and I said, what am I supposed to be doing? Camouflaging myself from paddling pools, but... That's not the one I had in mind. All right, yeah, yes. Well, are, are, you are you back to this wetsuit with the crotch what, cut out? Yes, that's the one. And yes. the bucket of soapy frogs. Ted would have been right up there, frankly. Yes. Um, like a rat up a drain pipe, perhaps. Yes. Mm. How's your singing voice? Hmm. Mm. No? Uh, what did you say? How is your singing voice? Oh, dreadful, dreadful. even though I'm Welsh. Oh, uh, well, there you go. Perhaps it will be a solo rendition of the Meat Militia National Anthem to close us out. Yes. Um, I'm fine with that. Um, I'm not usually allowed to sing when Pim's here. She's not singing, is yes. what she says. Oh, are we allowed to say what your ex-wife um, called Pim? Well, if you like. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. uh, and also, I still want to know when Spart recorded a video drunk and he, and he took it down, but we, were, we don't know what he actually did. Well, after I've had... We'll have to ask the yes. Swedish whore. Yes, that's what they call That's what my ex-wife called her. That Swedish whore. Um, anyway, at the end of the day, maybe I'll tell you later yes. behind the scenes about what I did when I had a drunken live stream once. Um, once, once we've got two or three of those little bottles of of alcohol you brought me down, perhaps I'll be a bit more loose in the lip. Yes, mm. which, as well, we have, I say in, in the UK, my slag lips and my bitch lips. You've only got mm. a rancid face, cunt. Is That's that... it. Yes. Yes, very good. <laughs> very good. I'm, I'm glad that you're up with the meat militia. Are we allowed today. to say that word? Oh, yes. To beep it out? yes. No, 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 it's okay. 
we, there are several things you can't do on the YouTubes, and saying the word cunt isn't one of them. Oh, you, right. you, can, you can call someone a cunt if you like. It just means you don't get as much well, advertising revenue, uh, which is fine because I get two-thirds of five-eighths of fuck all from that anyway. The thing is, maybe you have to... What about advertising sort of adult sex toys things? Or... Well, perhaps. Perhaps we should. Mm. Anyway. Maybe Frank should open up one of those to go along with his meat business. Yeah. Mm. Anyway. Those of you that are in uniform, you know the drill. You must be upstanding to attention and saluting in full throughout this rendition of the National Anthem of the Meat Militia. Mm -hmm. For those of you not in uniform, if you're able, you should be standing to show due respect for the National Anthem, which goes a little bit something like this. Two, three, four. Steak and eggs and eggs and steak. That's what you should have for your breakfast. Delicious. Eggs and steak and steak and eggs. Just making sure you heard he's got it. Very good. Thank you, boys and girls. Here's a round of applause for her, her eminence, mm -hmm. I guess. Field Marshal Dr. Sarah Pugh. Uh, a round of applause for you. Here it is. Thank you. Ted thinks it, you know how. Get out of my lap. Please. Yes. Right, and we'll close off with the usual music and, uh, you, you know, the drill. Clean up this operational briefing room on the way out the door. Don't leave any gum underneath the desks. Uh, any graffiti that you've put on the desk will need to be wiped off. Otherwise, you'll need to report to the Master Chief for head cleaning duties or something like that afterwards, whatever he's got in mind. Frankly, for naughty, naughty little soldiers, all right? I think they'd prefer it if I smack them, actually. I think they would, too. Yeah. Mm, perhaps I'll be a naughty soldier later, too. Yes. Mm, after I've had my alcohol. Yes. I, I don't need alcohol to be plied, frankly. I'm easy. It's not a vicious rumour. Okay. I'm anybody's. Just like Ted. And yes. Professor Fluffy, she's also a bit of a whore too. Oh yeah, frankly. she was terrible, yes. Mm. Anyway, we should let these people get on with their lives, shouldn't we? Right, so don't let the door hit you in the six on the way out. And staff, do stick around, because there's much more happening on the Meet Militia channel this week. All sorts of people are bound to be wrong on the interwebs, aren't they? See you then. Wave nicely, Ted. Come on, Ted, that's not very good. Much better, much better. All right, good. See you later then. Have some music. Two, three, four. Well, here we are, the next morning, the next morning after our special meet militia briefing and we're at Rough Island. It's a bit miserable, to be fair. Yeah, it's this, pretty rough here. Yes, this is not summer weather, is it, Field Marshal, Dr. Sarah? Yeah, it's a bit rough here, but... A bit rough. Haha, <laughs> very good. Right, anyway, off to take their fluffinesses for a walkies. have like big sandy beaches and stuff and picnic areas and all of that kind of carry on. Obsessed with doing Instagrams lately. Yes, I'm obsessed with doing Instagrams lately. <laughs> I'm told it's a good thing to do. That's because he's given up other addiction, so he's just getting a new one. He wants it. Something much more interesting He's to sniff found instead. A plum to eat. Mm, something sniff. Never mind the a bird or something. I'm done with eat. that game already. Well, this is a turn up. Apparently, there's a big stingray, bro. Do you see him still? Just jump out of the way if you don't want to be in the shot. Stingray bro! Stingray bro, I think that's where he probably is over there because he's awake, maybe. Stingray bro! Where are you? We saw him just before I started filming, of course. Now that I've got the camera out, just bug it off. He probably saw us coming. So, no, not interested. 
stingray, bro. Can you find the stingray? Can you find him? Oh. Tvor blood hunda. That's the tidal flow coming into this lagoon. Here he is, got him. There he is. Got him. You might see him on the shot here. Probably not with that light coming off. I doubt you can see him on this camera shot, but he's definitely there. About two feet across the wingspan, not a huge one, but he is there. Mm -hmm.